Hello, my name's Angelo and welcome to the best and first episode of Player of Chat featuring Matt Trebbiani. It's Trebbiani, right? Trebbiani. Excellent, welcome and thank you very much for coming out. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so Matt uh, is the developer of Hacknet and uh, the recently released uh, Hacknet Liber Labyrinths, yep. your expansion and stuff. Yep. So yeah, can you walk us through a little bit about what Hacknet is really? Yeah, sure. So it's like a, a terminal driven hacking simulator game that's meant to be so realistic you can't play in an airport. Uh, not that I haven't done a whole bunch of like development on planes and in airports before. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's designed to just be like super immersive, super realistic. Uses like mostly real terminal commands, um, like correct port numbers and like uh, lots of like theory from uh, like computer security itself. But basically, whenever you're like making a game about hacking, you have to like draw a line somewhere, right? So on this end, you've got like the the tube game from Bioshock, which is yeah. not very realistic. Yeah. And in this game, you've got uh, what we call the internet, which is a game that already exists, right? Um, so you've got to like pick your point of realism from like not real to completely real, which is still like sort of a game to a whole bunch of people, but like you've got to pick your point in that line. So I tried to pick the point that would require you not to have a computer science degree, and would cut out a bunch of like boring stuff, right? So it's mostly chasing after like the the feel and. Uh, like the, the ideas and the style of thinking and like investigating that you want to do when you're like looking to break into something. Um, and I've got really good responses from like how well that's gone. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. But that's yeah, that's what Hacknet's about. It's mostly, um, it's like a hacking simulation game designed to be pretty realistic. It's a, like strongly narrative driven at the start, but it offers a lot of freedom. So that's the design course. Nice. Yeah. All right. So how much hacking was involved in making the game in that sense like it, <laughs> so you're saying that you had to you had to skirt a line between completely fake and completely real mm -hmm. to, to give the user like you know a more enjoyable experience because mm -hmm. i'd imagine just doing a, the real real kind of hacking is super boring super intricate all that kind of stuff right mm -hmm. is yeah that correct yeah yeah it's super so, tentacle and like really tedious a lot of the time um and it's also like not a video game. Like, yeah, yeah. You can already do that, and you don't need to like buy something on Steam. That's to, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can you can do more more adrenaline inducing stuff by hacking like an old bank or something probably. Right? <laughs> yeah. But so how how much sure. so how much hacking have you done in that case to be able to give something like this like is this just like sort of you know <laughs> sort of hacking like home networks that you're like at home or anything like that you know doing like modifications to your own home network and things or. I have no idea about hacking. When, yeah, I, when so I think of hacking, I think of that terrible Angelina <laughs> Jolie film from like 1995. So. I actually love that film. So. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, so I get this question a bit, and it's yeah. like, so I've got kind of like a response for it already, yep, yep. but like, uh, basically the gist of it is that like, I've done a computer science degree, and I never paid for printing. Like, I see. So, so like enough to enough to mess around at university, right? Cause a bunch of trouble at school. Yeah, like you yeah. work out how to send messages over the network, even though they don't want you to and stuff. Just to right? be more of a nuisance yeah. rather than a threat. I uh, I never I never got into as much trouble as the game gets into, but yeah. um, it's uh, yeah, I think uh, I think there's a healthy amount of uh, like messing with security stuff that you should do when you're doing a computer science degree to really round out that education. Yeah. So like I would say I had my share of that. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. So, um, yeah, because I've had a bit of a play of it as well. And again, me not knowing anything about that kind of stuff, yeah. how much uh, hacking, you know, can be compared to what we do in the game. So like in the game, for example, we do a mm. lot of like DOS commands and things like that, like, you know, yeah. running through um, directories, deleting things, all that kind of stuff. Like how much of that is basically what, what hacking would really be? Yeah. So um, I guess a different way of asking that is like, where is the abstraction drawn? Sure. Like, what would to yeah? That's so, a better way of asking. Um, yeah. So the real Unix commands, like, um, like you'd remember like ls and cd, right? So like to change directories and move up and down, like so that's all real. Like navigating file systems and like quickly picking at files from the terminal. Yeah. It's like I use the real commands for that because that's actually like the best way to do it. Um, like those commands exist that way for a reason, and the reason is, I mean, partly historical, but partly because that was like a really efficient and like powerful way to navigate a computer and like investigate um, different things about it. Yeah, it's also a very yeah. rudimentary way of doing it. Like, say, if a computer breaks or something, mm. like people who repair computers would have to do that to some sense, anyways, mm. to repair them. So yeah, so so those sort of bits, like once you're connected and broken into something, is uh, pretty realistic. Um, the port numbers and stuff are all realistic, and it basically basically the abstraction is drawn at the point where it's like as if you were an exceptionally good like script kitty, like you've gotten a bunch of programs that. Uh, exploit non-weaknesses on 
versions of ports. So if you're in computer security, you know about like certain versions of like really old FTP and there exists like known FTP exploits that can like run up for a code once you've like connected to something that like established a connection to something that's got that port open. So um, it'll, and they're, they're running like the right FTP hosting software to like abuse that port. So um, basically the game, where it would otherwise give you a bunch of, in the real world, you'd probably run into like, you know, the source code of how the security system works. So you'd, yep. you'd find the version number of whatever service they're running. You'll basically just find like something that's closer to like lock and key. So it abstracts that away a fair bit. So it's like, oh, they're, they're running this FTP port, then you've got like a program that breaks this FTP port. And then like there's some other security that you might have to get past. But um, it pretty much draws the, draws the line at like, yeah, not needing any technical knowledge of how like the like the packets and stuff are working underneath, and uh, lets you just get straight to like the investigating and like you know you found the weakness and like you either do or don't have a way of breaking it. Yep. It gets a little bit more complicated towards the end, yep. um, and like at, at certain points in the story, just so that you know to show a little bit more of what's going on behind it. But that's pretty much where the line is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, the game also has a set story to it as well. Like mm -hmm. you basically you, you start sort of hacking, you know, these smaller terminals and things, and then you sort of unravel sort of like a deeper mystery involved where someone mm. has already died, um, and you know they've left messages for you to follow, like breadcrumbs and things like that. So how did yep. you come up with that? I mean, it's, it sounds like a sort of like the whole ghost in the box thing, you know? How, yeah. You know, you, you get this thing, and then there's some, there's something sort of possessing it and talking to you. Yeah. Through, like you know, so so how did you come up with that sort of concept? Uh, I actually can't even remember at this point. It's like that was a really long time ago. Yep. Um, it's not like the whole story just came out at once. Like I had a couple of bits and pieces that were like floating around in my head, and then I made them slowly over time. And then once those bits were made. Like I saw like holes and then I patched them and um, like rounded out like over a long period of time. Like I'd written the uh, the beginning like a really long time ago, being like I know that I want to start the game with a message from someone that's dead, mm -hmm. um, and they're going to be uh, like the person that will help guide you through the start and get you set up. Uh, and I knew that's the way I wanted to make it, but I hadn't really sorted out like the ending and um, like some other details of the story until like really late in development. Um, so it kept like changing over time. But uh, it's like a it's like a really weird question, right? Like, how'd you come up with the story? It's like yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I was just sort of making stuff up. Well, and so so, so like... it's, it's not something that you like you were inspired by, but you you know, say hackers for example, that would be like nothing from that sort of called in. It was like, oh, I'd like to do a game about hacking or anything. Like, how did how did you marry something like a, a story about someone who's dead with it? You know, and there's a conspiracy surrounding that to mm. game elements where you're hacking. Um, like, so what was the connection? Yeah. So this is. I, I don't want to like just pin the responsibility on this because I'm not actually sure where it came from, but um, like uh, setting up these dead man switches is something that I've talked about with a bunch of like people in the computer science degree before, just because like in that sort of environment, those sort of people are like, it's really fun to talk about like covering every possible case, including cases in which you die like halfway through your work, right? So um, we'd talk about like setting up dead man switches and um, a dead man switch is a, like a, a thing, that you, a button that you have to keep pressing basically and if you don't press it for like a certain amount of time it assumes that you can't press it because you're dead and then it sends out a bunch of like things. Yep. So um, that's basically like what triggers at the start of uh, Hacknet and then yeah so like that was something that I thought was like really fascinating as like a concept like like what would you put in your message like what's like so important to you and what are you like working on and like what would you say like what do you need to say like why would you make one of those and there are some pretty valid reasons for that um and exploring those options was like really interesting so um that was like a big inspiration for it all mm. yeah so how long did it take for you to develop a game like hacknet because you know most time most of the time when it comes to developing a game you know nowadays we've got 3d animation or you know 3d environments or yeah. 2d animation hand-drawn animation stuff like that so how, how long did it take to basically create a text base game um, <laughs> of this sort of thing. Yeah, so there's a lot of really hidden complexity to hacking in terms of like the code base and the design. Um, so in terms of like the technical problems, uh, basically like it looks like a sort of text-based game, but there's actually like a whole operating system there, yep. um, and like a virtual simulated network and stuff. And like although the individual pieces of that aren't that hard to build, like there's just a lot of it. Like that terminal is not taken from anywhere. I had to like rewrite all of the commands for a working terminal yep. um, and have them all like you know, function properly. Like, especially compared to like more traditional games, like a Mario or something. 
Hackman has a lot of moving parts, yeah. like a lot of different ways you can interact with the system. So, so is it just like a, a smaller version of like a Linux system or something mm, like that? Yeah, yeah, it? yeah, pretty much exactly. Yeah. Um, so in terms of like building that and making sure it like, you know, it worked and it was like relatively bug free, it was like yeah. a huge effort. Um, but it's something that like is like really fun to program and work on um, because there's like a lot of really interesting challenges and a lot of things that like once you get started and you decide on a framework, it all just falls out really nicely. Mm. Um, so it was really fun to work on, but like it was a huge job coding that. Um, and also in terms of the design, like the second thing I was going to mention was uh, I, I don't think there was that much like Hacknet when mm. I, it was in development, or even still now, there's not too much like it. So when I was making design decisions about how I wanted to do things, um, there wasn't a whole lot that I could like look at and be like, oh, I'll pick one of these options that these other games have done. Or like, I, you know, there wasn't that much that I could like play and see how they'd solve the problems in order to find solutions to my own things. So a lot of it was just like making something up and trying it and seeing like how oh, this doesn't work. Um, like the email system seems really natural now that like it's in the game, but like that went through a whole bunch of variations. And I know like Uplink, which was a huge inspiration for the game, used email as well. And I was trying really hard like not to use their system because yeah. I wanted to be different. And uh, like I tried a whole bunch of things before I settled on being like, uh, yeah, email is actually just the best answer to this yeah. problem. Um, and then like much later, like too late to change it in development, I found a different solution, which is like the IRC thing that I use in Labyrinth. Oh, um, yeah. So like, yeah, um, with Labyrinth, a lot of it was like, so a lot of the process was trying to come up with solutions to design problems that um, were in like that didn't have obvious solutions that I couldn't like uh, compare with other games to like find a solution for. So uh, a lot of the base game was like finding solutions to that, and there was a lot of design work, trial and error, and stuff, um, trying to find something that worked and that really like held that feeling that like from the very start of the game like had that good hacker feeling. And I was like, it was like a needle thread line, like trying to like not ruin that as yeah. I kept the development going. Um, so a lot of it was just like trying to find design answers that solve those problems without breaking that, um, or ideally that made it stronger. And then um, a whole bunch of what Labyrinth was, was like taking the answers that I found much later in the development that was like better, that I thought were better, um, and then like trying to put them in the game because it was too late to make those changes yep. when I was at the end of Hacknet development. Yep. Yeah. So, <laughs> so very long-winded answer to the original yeah, question yeah. was that like, yeah, there were a whole bunch of things that made it take a really long time. Yeah. Um, like technical and design wise. Um, so I'd been working on Hacknet for I think like three and a bit years. Okay. When uh, when it came out. Yeah. Okay. That's that's yeah. That's probably I'd say for for someone who's working because you're basically working on the game on your own, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's pretty standard, I'd imagine. Like three three and a half years. That's yeah. probably on the shorter end of a game that's been made by someone by themselves. You know, our boy mm. took what ten years or something like that. Mm. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, so then, when did the development on um, Labyrinth start? Like, did that start pretty much immediately afterwards, or were you busy patching the original game and then you moved over to Labyrinth? Yeah, yeah. So, um, see, I, I had no idea if this was like a good amount of stuff to have done by the like one year after its launch. Yep. Um, but there's like a lot of stuff to do, um, like when you put out a video game. Like, yeah. I was going like all over the place for different conventions, um, and uh, I uh, ported to Mac and Linux. Mm -hmm. um, and then translated it into eight languages. Um, so did you have to outsource? You would have had to outsource the translating, right? Yeah, no, I don't speak eight yeah, languages. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, and uh, I also got help at the port from um, Ethan Lee, who's really awesome. He runs the FNA project. Um, and that's like, uh, that lets me do this really cool build setup where I like compile it on Windows and then I can deploy from the Windows build to Mac and Linux, which is crazy. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, I know it's really good. So, um, so that was really cool. So he helped with that. But there's uh, a whole lot of work to do with like a bunch of different things with that. Um, and translations too. Man, translating this game was a nightmare. Yeah, I could imagine. Because um, would the yeah. commands be very similar? Uh, no, the commands aren't translated at all. Okay. So terminals are actually in English, like everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's because they use the same code and they're identified by name. It's like a weird sort of artifact. But that, like, I initially thought the game was untranslatable because of that. But it turns out that. That and a couple of other little quirks mean that you can get away with not translating big portions of the game, like deliberately, uh, because that's actually how it works. So mm -hmm. um, it also means that, like in other languages, the game's harder because you have to write in English for a bunch of it, um, which means you need to learn English things, which means that like it's harder for like 
your memory to connect to it and stuff. Yep. So there's a whole bunch of challenges there. And also, like, when it got it all translated, I got a bunch of the files back. And because they're quite technical, the way they work, like, they translated a bunch of, like, the like the, the hooks that, like, tie into my code. So, they, like, a bunch of the parts of the game just didn't work because, mm. like, the, like, you know, the ad rank at the end of this mission was translated into French or whatever. And yeah. the game didn't pick it up. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of problems. So I was working on the base game with, like, a bunch of things like that. Um, put out like 50 updates or something like mostly for bug fixes but with like some small feature changes and improvements and things. Um, that was over like the first year and then um, uh, what was it? Yeah, a, a couple of months after that I think a month or two after that I started work on Labyrinths. Okay. Um, I think I actually started looking into doing Labyrinth stuff um, just before the translation thing happened and then uh, Steam got in touch and was like we have like a like a deal slot for you if you can get translations done in this time and then like we were just sprinting to do that and then like Labyrinth had to get delayed because of that yep. and, um, yeah but I think Labyrinth's been developing like like eight months ish like oh, six eight months yeah um, it was like relatively quick compared to the base game yep. um, and yeah and that's like come out a little while ago and it's about a month out now I think yeah okay cool so about three years for the base game, about six to eight months for Labyrinths. Mm -hmm. awesome. Alright, so stepping away from Labyrinths now, so mm -hmm. um, how does it, how difficult was it to be able to do a self, a, just a self-developed indie game in Adelaide? Because you know, Adelaide's pretty s separated from all these other gaming communities around mm. the place, like the, the real central hub of game development for indies and you know, I guess even AAA development, whatever's left yep. here is mostly Melbourne. Mm -hmm. So how, what was it like developing a game here rather than moving somewhere else and doing it over there? Uh, I think it's really hard to answer because I've never like moved somewhere else yeah. and tried it over there. Um, well, was the experience was like, overly difficult for you or did you just... Again, just it's like, it? it's hard to say because I, I'm just like, so like self-contained in my own stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, I know a lot of other people like get a bunch of like uh, government support and they have yeah. grants and like funds and like office space and things like that and that's not just something that I've never really gotten it's also something I've never like really pursued right yeah. like I was just working on games in my own little office and like I didn't really have other people to do that I was doing it in my like spare time after work I hadn't really considered like you know getting a grant for it or anything and then like finishing Hacknet was Hard, right like I like went into debt a lot like mm. getting all the songs and things together and like paying for the licenses and like trying to get the marketing rolling and, and like that was like a hard time but that's like fine right like I was ready to take that chance because I loved the game um, so from that perspective I have never felt like I was like missing anything like for the sort of people that would be going out and getting grants and stuff to try and like fund their development like I I could see that being like harder here but that's not something I've ever really done. I've always just sort of worked on my own games and just done it because I wanted to. And like, I would have actually thought it would be like madness and lucky for someone to just give me money to keep doing that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in that sense, I don't think I've really been like, I don't know, milking the system as much mm -hmm. as like other people would like. And like, and that that's like a good thing to do, right? You want people to. Like use the resources to develop with them to make Absolutely. better things, right? Absolutely. Uh, but I think because of like my like development style, I guess I've never really needed that, so I haven't felt like Adelaide talking me back at all. Okay. Um, and the Adelaide community has been really nice. Um, mm. It is a bit, it's a bit better in Melbourne just because there's mm. it's a bit bigger and they have like packs and um, like a whole bunch of the other like like resources that are really nice over there. But uh, it's hard to say if that would have helped development or anything at all. Um, Mostly just because I haven't tried it. Yep. Um, and I think largely when I go over there, it's like as much as it's really helpful to talk to other people with experience and stuff, um, like I can talk to a whole lot of them online. Like I'm friends with them. And um, yeah, I don't, really, don't feel held back by being in Adelaide at all. Um, in terms of like, you know, what the, the city's like given me for being a game developer, like, I mean, not not heaps, but also not nothing. Like, I'm not, I'm not really sure what that even means, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, like <laughs> Is the city you live in supposed to just give you money or resources or office yeah. space just because you do like a thing? Like, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, that seems weird, right? Mm. Um, and like, it seems really weird to like expect that. Uh, so, 
I think, uh, yeah, I think Adelaide's been great, right? Like, I, I like the other developers here. I think it's got a pretty good scene. I don't feel like I'm alone developing here. Um, yeah, and it's nice to be close to Melbourne to like just hop over there for the like events and like conventions and things. Yeah, I mean it's like an hour yeah. flight. So yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's no problem. That's that's interesting then, because um, so does that mean that like you see yourself just staying in Adelaide doing your thing, or or like you know you said that you didn't have any new aspirations to have like a big sort of development space or anything like that? You I mean, not on. not yet. Maybe eventually. But yeah, so yeah. so do you have aspirations eventually? Like say five, ten, twenty years? You know, you have maybe your own studio or something mm -hmm. like that. Is that something that you want? You have like a team to work with. You want to work on other games? I think. Um, or are you happy right now just kind of working on your own stuff? Yeah, I think uh, that's one of those like questions that's kind of strange to me. Like, uh, I want a big enough team to be working on the projects that I want to make. Yep. Um, I don't want a team for the sake of having like a team, right? Yep. Um, in fact, that would be like horrifying because teams are expensive oh, yeah, and absolutely. office space is expensive. Yep. Um, so I don't want to like increase burn rate for nothing, uh, but um, I'm not really looking at projects that are so big that I could make them with like one or two other people, right? Mm -hmm. Like eventually, like if I am working with a bunch of other people, like I'm not going to do another solo game. It's it's madness. <laughs> don't do it. Um, but uh, if I am working with a bunch of other people, you know, maybe off space is nice. And I want to like sort of scale up organically. I don't just want to be like, oh, I want a team of five people and then we'll find out something that's five person size to work on. Like, no, I'm going to do a bunch of prototypes. And if I feel like I'm, like it's what I really want to be working on requires like a lot more than just me, then, you know, I'll just scale up to fit that. Yeah. But, um, so what would the, like, what so the next project from you sort of look like then? Would it be another sort of text-based thing or will it have, you know, mm. will it have a physics engine? Will it have <laughs> will it, graphics? Will, will it, it have a physics <laughs> engine? <laughs> will it have a little man running around or anything like that? Um, I want to work on something that's very unlike Hacknet next, um, just because, um, like, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in the Hacknet-ish sort of space that I feel like would be awesome to work on and I am pretty convinced I could do a pretty good job of and that I will probably work on eventually. Yep. But I want to step away from that for a little bit first um, and work on things that are really different mm -hmm. just to try and like keep my mind open as a designer um, and try not to like chew on myself into this one very specific role Absolutely. and like lose sight of like the other options that are out there. Um, so I'm going to work on something really different next, I think. Um, yep. And I'm probably going to look into some sort of like the uh, thing just because the tech's really cool. Yeah, um, you could gonna, actually make it look like hackers in that case. I mean, just flying through a cyberspace. I mean, that's that's like the low key thing. Eventually, <laughs> I'd love to make something like that, and I probably will. And it's probably going to be amazing. Yeah, the um, next res. Yeah, be sweet. But um, but before then, I want to make something like really different. Um, probably something with farming. I like farming. Oh yeah, VR farming. Have you, have you tried like you know Stardew Valley or? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, have I tried Stardew Valley? Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not sure. Um, basically, like, I want to play around with a bunch of other like technologies and things. Like I know Unity quite well, and so I'll probably use that to prototype out a bunch of stuff, right? Like pick an engine or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting to be playing around with like uh, the VR tech, just because it's fun to use and it's like exciting and new and interesting. So. I'll probably, um, once I step away from Hacknet a bit, I'll like, experiment with a bunch of different stuff and just see what feels good. Mm. Sort of like take a bit more casual approach, make some like weird stuff. Um, I think VR's nice for that because you can make some weird stuff and it's still exciting to play around in because the tech's so cool. Yep. Um, where like, you know, small weird PC games like have a very different market. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably what I'm going to be working on next. Um, eventually I'll probably probably come crawling back to like either the Hacknet IP or like that sort of um, space because like I do still love it somehow after all this time. Yeah. Um, that uh, for a little while after this I'm going to work on something like really different. Cool. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll look forward to that. Yeah. yeah I'll look forward to that. So, um, alright, so if you don't mind me sort of like flopping up your ego a little bit. Mm. So, I remember... But please do. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I remember when Hacknet came out, I don't know anything about the game at this point. Um, mm -hmm. It was 2015, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, August. Yep, so um, I remember going to PAX and I was there with a bunch of people who are huge nerds. They do a, little, a couple of them, like, you know, do a lot of programming and stuff like that. One of them works for some um, investment firm or something like mm -hmm. that, doing um, 
doing their software engineering. Yeah. Things. So, um, and they were, they were just like gushing about this game called Hackman and all this. And then eventually, like over the weekend, like I just bumped into more people and just heard more and more about this game called Hackman. Yeah, so yeah. I, came, I went over my, oh yeah, this game looks really sweet. Found out that you're from Adelaide and stuff. Yeah. So what was, it, what was it like sort of being like an indie game development success story for Adelaide? Like what was it like going from sort of like, I don't know, being in your home office, whittling away at this game that's, you know, just all about hacking, a very sort of niche mm. thing to like kind of finding a lot of success like quite, quite quickly. Yeah. What was that like? Um, I mean, this is like, I, I say success, like, yeah. success could be with quotation marks, like you know. So I, I feel I feel like it's been a really big success. Like, yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we should like you know pretend that it hasn't been. I've been very lucky, and um, like it's it's done great, and like it's all awesome. Um, but were there any downsides like, with that too? Yeah, yeah. So so this is like why this is like a weird answer, right? Like yep. yeah, obviously it's great and amazing and really cool, um, but it's also like a lot of like pressure hmm. and it's very like uh it's really overwhelming um especially going into it like like mostly on your own um there are like a lot of uh like decisions that get like uh, a lot bigger there's this weird this weird consequence and this is like maybe obnoxious to talk about i don't know but this weird like thing that happens where like i'm not super convinced that like the human brain is designed to just be happy mm -hmm. right like um, it, it We're getting into some high-level thinking stuff now. Yeah, yeah. So like, like, you really quickly reach this point that like, all of these nice things, and like, and I get like, I get like a lot of emails, right, and like a lot of people like saying they like the game, and I'm like super grateful for that, and I, it's it's amazing, but that stuff like, very quickly starts to just like wash over you mm -hmm. and be like meaningless, right? And you will find just like, I found myself like, trying not to do this. But like you can scroll through like thousands of positive reviews, right? And you will only remember the one negative oh, one absolutely. where someone's like, "Eh, not for me." And that all, and it's like that's not even a bad negative yeah, review. Yeah. That's fine. Like I'm okay with like I know this game's not for everyone, but like, like it just haunts you. Yeah. And like, and people writing these like huge amazing essays, like, and like saying these like awesome things, are, like just like start to become meaningless and it's like and that sucks yeah. right like that doesn't feel fair um is that because you kind of become numb to the positivity that you know the the negativity is what stings is that what it is i, I think so like and you just become sort of self-critical because you're waiting i like i'm not sure because i haven't seen it from the other perspective but maybe it's just like the thing that you don't get as much of is the one that's like has more impact right like if you get heaps of negativity then the one positive thing might really make your day right that's, yeah that's true but, um, that's true. Like, it's hard to say like it's so so that I definitely started to notice that quite quickly mm -hmm. and that was like really shitty to run into because you're like oh like man like I'm like I'm like I'm really proud of like how the game's turned out and like I'm really happy that people are liking it right and it's like like so quickly you just become like inured against it like that's that's weird and unfortunate so there's definitely a lot of that um some other stuff like uh like your mistakes start quickly getting more expensive yep. uh, and this sort of thing happens like uh where like if you if i put out a patch and like ruin everyone saves right like like the bigger your game gets the more like colossal that mistake yeah. feels um like yeah it feels like you can't make as many like mistakes and also that you know your, your mistakes and stuff cost you a lot more like in terms of like if you ever had that like if you put out that patch and your reviews dip because you know you broke everyone's saves and that's a very legitimate thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it is your fault and you, your game might never recover from that. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, um, so it comes with a lot of like weird pressure um, and like stress and like, it's, uh, it's hard to see like, I guess like the first like 24 hours of like Labyrinth's launch, right? Like, I, uh, I put the game, put the game out and um, like a lot of people were playing and stuff and they were really excited but like all I could see and this is because this is like what I've like geared my setup to like put in my face right because it needs to happen is just like floods of bug reports and things yeah. that don't work and things that are broken like how yeah. could you not check this right like um like the the entire Chinese like localization was like broken like because one of those like again the translations like i've got so many automated checks but like i don't know must have missed one somewhere mm -hmm. and it meant that a little connector in the chinese version didn't work yeah and all right it's hard for me to find because i don't speak chinese absolutely but, yeah, um, that makes sense like so um i've caught most of the others like all of the others but like 
yeah, this little thing was broken. And everyone in China emailed me. Everyone, all, everyone. <laughs> all of China emailed wow. me to tell me this was broken. Um, and like, so, like, I've got that, and this is like, this is like a couple of hours into launch, and yeah, I'm just yeah, on the forums yeah. being like, people like, oh, it doesn't start up, or like, it doesn't work, or like, I got the patch, and now my save's corrupted, and I'm like, oh, I've fucked up everything, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, you can't see that anyone's completed it because no one goes into the bug reports thread and be like oh my work's fine everything's fine like yeah, yeah. No, everyone is super <laughs> unhappy and like and they've paid money for it and you're like oh shit right like, yeah. um and there's like so there's that and like so the first first like 24 hours especially is just like i don't know i think I, the game launches at like 2 a.m that's like uh i think what well, surprise stack my publisher found is like the best launch time so we stay up at 2 a.m and then like I fix bugs and stuff until like 8 a.m. I was like, all right, I'm just gonna sleep, and then like wake up in the morning and just do this cycle again until yeah. like until it works, right? Except it's a slog, isn't it? So so I went through that and that like that first six hours sucked, yeah. and I was like I like I went to bed just being like I've just fucked everything up. This sucks. Like and I need to sleep because I know I'm just like every patch I put out is gonna make it worse from like here on yeah. out because my brain's just gone. Yeah. And then woke up in the morning and was like, oh, it's actually stable now. Everything's fine. Okay. Like the last one just worked out, right? And I'm like, all right, never touch it again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just walk, go away. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So that was that worked out really well. Like um, that I got like the launch chaos for Labyrinth done in like the first six hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I felt really good about that because there were some tricky bugs in there. Um, but so that was great. But like, man, the pressure the pressure from that. Like, original Hacknet had a bug where like people's save files would get deleted. And that sucks, yeah, like, that's people are not happy about that, and they have right to be unhappy. Mm. Um, so, like, like as much as you, I put it through, like, lots of testing, like, there's still, these things just happen, like, it's, yep. especially with a project like Hacknet, where there's so much, so many interactions to test. Yep. Um, yeah, like, I have, like, pretty fancy, like, test suites and stuff set up now, like, that are all automated. But, uh, yeah, kind of catch everything. Yeah, video games and all right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so there's that. Um, and it's like, when I was going through development, you go through these weird up-down cycles where it's like, I'll be like, alternate between thinking like, oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. And I'm like, I'm so, so happy with how this is all coming out. Like, I really like it. And then you like go down and be like, I should quit development now because this is so atrociously <laughs> bad yeah. that like, if I put out this DLC, it's going to ruin the product forever, yeah. right? And like, and you just have like no objectivity at all. Um, so so I was in like I was in like the down phase when it was like Labyrinth's launch week, where I was like, yeah, this actually this actually sucks. Like I've I've made a mistake. Like I've actually made something terrible, <laughs> right? And I'm about to launch it and like just screw everything up. Like what am I doing? And I'm like seriously looking at it, just thinking like maybe I should just call it. Just sit on the plane. Just yeah, maybe I should, maybe I should delete everything. <laughs> Sorry if I come out like freaking out about it. And like I just had no gauge at all. Um, if it was good or bad or like, it's like, yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Mm. Um, and yeah, I got, um, Chris Johnson to play through. So he's going to be the next, next topic. Yeah. Yeah. Session, so I got so Chris yeah. Johnson to play through, um, like, uh, Labyrinth. So I can play through all my games if I can, because he'll like record his screen and like, especially with Hacknet, he'll track out little messages to me in the terminal, um, like while he's playing to like commentate on what's going on. Um, yeah, it's really good. And. He has like really good insights um, into like what things are good and bad, and um, his playthroughs especially are really useful. So I got him to play through it, and was basically like, like talk to him a bit about it, and was like, all right, I'm gonna make some like massive changes to the way this all works, like right now. I'm gonna go through all of the languages and manually do the changes in every language myself, um, and just like hope it works out mm -hmm. and like changed a bunch of pretty important stuff like the day before launch like with zero testing to be like I'm just gonna change it because I think it's gonna be better who knows right yep. um, and that's like never a good idea <laughs> but like I did it and I'm really happy I did because I think it was the right choice that um, I still went into Labyrinth's launch being like I don't know if that change was the right idea I know that I hate the problem and I think I ruined it with the problems that were there like beforehand mm -hmm. and that was because like Chris played through the game without using a whole bunch of the tools that I provided because I like made like very small changes to make them not necessary. Mm -hmm. So he'd just play it in like the least fun possible way. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I need to make this change that enforces what I think is a more fun, more interesting playstyle. Um, but 
yeah, they had real problems. Um, it was like terrifying, and I was like putting the game out, just being like, I have no idea if this is total garbage or not. Mm -hmm. um, and like, was seriously worried that I might have released something that was just terrible. Mm -hmm. um, just because you've got like no clarity at all. Um, anyway, then like, you know, game came out and like reviews started coming in, you know, people really like it now. And like, um, I'm pretty sure at this point that like, uh, like we're at like 100% positive Steam reviews. It's crazy. Oh, wow. Yeah, for Labyrinth. Um, that's yeah, so don't don't mess that yeah, up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the video will go up and then it'll just be down at like four percent. Mm. I know, but like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then like some really nice things started coming out from like um, like you know media sites and things and like reviewers and stuff that I really like. I, whose opinions I like really respect. Yeah. And like, and they said that it was really good, and I was like, okay, you know, maybe it's maybe it's okay. Like we're we're good. Like so, launching a game that's. Uh, sort of takes off a bit and like has a lot of like buzz around it and feedbacks like really amazing and really good but um, it puts you under a lot of a lot of pressure and there's a lot of like weird stuff that goes on like and I don't know how much like a like a human brain is geared to deal with that well um, and it's not like I was having breakdowns and stuff but it was a uh, just artistic stress yeah I mean there's a lot of there's a lot of stress that comes with it as much as it's like amazing um, and it's, it's also a lot of weirdness which is like I didn't feel like I was allowed to be <clears throat> anything except overjoyed because that's mm. like it's like everything that I wanted from it, yeah. right? And like you know, you get it all and you're like, oh, this sucks. Like yeah. you can't you can't do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I would say overall, highly recommend it. <laughs> Successful games, pretty good. That's but cool. um, yeah, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of weirdness that comes with it. Too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, going back to Chris Johnson, so we, we talked a lot about Chris <laughs> yeah. Johnson, so yeah. for those who don't know, Chris Johnson is also another Adelaide-based uh, games developer who created Expand, a game that kind of ran power, or was, was developed uh, parallel to your game, mm -hmm. and um, both games were basically, they weren't really neck and neck or competing or anything, they're completely, they're completely starkly different games, but mm -hmm. they were sort of the two games that people looked at when they thought of Adelaide indie development, and uh, they came out roughly around the same time as well. Expand a little bit after. Yeah, a little bit after. And... Um, yeah, so Chris, Chris will actually hopefully be a guest on the show, so hopefully we'll, we'll get his perspective oh, on some nice. of the things too, which would be great. <laughs> He's a lovely guy to talk to. Yeah. Um, so there was an article that came out, which was an interview between you two, so it was you and Chris and Mark Serrells for Kotaku, mm -hmm. and that was talking about the success of the success and I guess you know non-success of two indie games that were kind of made sort of in conjunction with each other, and you both sort of were like friendly rivals, but also sort of um, you know. You were rivals, but you're also friendly to each other and helped each other. Yeah, out we're really like good friends. Yeah. yeah, and um, the article talked about how your game went on to succeed and you know got heaps of really good reviews, heaps of people played it, all that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, his game didn't really make the splash that people were hoping, mm. even though it got like a lot of critical praise. You know, mm. got a very favorable review from Cam Shea of IGN. You know, one of the biggest video game websites in, in the world. And um, a lot of other people also liked it, but it just didn't seem to stick well with just you know the wider the wider audience. Yeah, um, we'll so qualify here that um, it's commercial success. Commercial there's a, there's success, a lot of different kinds right. of success. That's the entire and, right. Um, yeah. yeah, and we're just talking about like sales numbers, basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. So, and um, well, yeah. Just going on from that. So, what was that like talking talking to Mark Serrells and doing this interview alongside with Chris and getting those two different perspectives of the mm -hmm. same sort of side of any development where one goes on to be a commercial success and one, you know, unfortunately doesn't. Mm -hmm. So what was that like from your um, perspective? I mean, that whole interview process was really good and Mark did an awesome job. Mm -hmm. um, like really... He did touch on a very respectful and very, uh, uh, what do I want to say, human interest sort of side, you know, we got yeah, a really yeah. good story from both, from both sides. Yeah, we, we spent a lot of time recording that. I think we recorded like four hours of talking oh. or something. Um, and he oh. just like cut it all down and um, really like, and, and I'd casually mention people in the articles and he'd double check all of those sources with them personally yeah. and stuff. Um, and that was really good. Um, I think, uh, I really liked the article. Um, it was a little bit, uh, yeah, strange again. Like, I'm not sure how I was supposed to react to it or feel. Yep. Like, um, again, part of this whole, like, uh, you game succeeding thing is that, like, a lot of, like, delicate social stuff becomes a lot more complex. Like, yep. um, am I supposed to, like, how am I supposed to react to that article, especially, yeah. like, around Chris and, like, uh, and like how am I supposed to talk about it? And, well, did it like, affect your relationship with Chris, or are you guys... No, 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 I don't think the article did. Like, um, like we're, we're pretty good friends. I think, um, like, it was, uh, it was, like, a, a weird time for both of us, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, Chris and I are really great friends, and, like, I'm really glad the article went up, because I think it was, like, a really, 
um, a really good and interesting like personal piece about how like I mean, these sort of business things are, are weird and challenging and how video games is like a, a crazy thing and like mm. the, the markets aren't like dictated by quality or whatever um, and like the like commercial realities of it are so wildly different between like you know slightly different kinds of success and it's, it's you know it's a weird place um, and I, I think the article was great and um, like I think Mark did an amazing job on it and was really happy to be involved with it all mm. but um there's a good follow-up story from that that yeah. uh, Chris worked in this game called Morai. Um, yeah. You might have heard of it. Yeah. yeah. So that um that was it was a really interesting game. It was very short. It only yeah, goes yeah. about ten minutes. If yeah. You look it up. Morai was it called? Morai. Morai. M O R A I. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that was like a really small experimental game um, that Chris was like, Chris was jokingly talking about like uh, putting it up on Steam because I think it got greenlit during the time okay. when greenlit was greenlight. Greenlight was like greenlighting everything. So it was like, oh, I'll yeah, put it up yeah. on Steam for free and it would be like you know, a funny little thing. It was this super experimental, like, little 10 minute game. And that just blew up massively. I was just sticking around on the Steam front page. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, like, a whole bunch of stuff going on with that. Um, and, uh, like, Chris sent me a message about it on, like, launch day. Um, I remember specifically he was, uh, he was talking about, um, like, launching it on, like, uh, Avcon, one of the Avcon days, mm -hmm. um, which would have just been the most yeah. horrible nightmare. Yeah. You're, you're stressed enough at a convention, like, yeah. talking to thousands of people. You don't want to be, you don't want to be dealing with your servers exploding somewhere, yeah. or, like, wherever they're being hosted. Um, so, yeah, that, like, that took off massively, and just, like, everyone was playing it. I think, like, Markiplier and stuff were, like, playing it. Um, just got, like, it was outrageous. Like, there's actually a special room in that game that, like, puts a little mark up on the wall, um, like whenever someone plays it, right? Because mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like weirdly online and connected. Yeah. Um, and I was the first play through the game because he showed me it when like he first made it. So I was like the first little mark on the wall. And like, but for everyone else that saw it, it was just this room that was just like black because it was just covered like yeah. with everything, right? So it was like this weird room. I remember that, yeah. Um, yeah. So because I remember playing that game, he he sent it to me. I think I was like the fifth or sixth person to play it, so I was really early on. And um, you know, being so early on or something like that, you couldn't really look up anything else about it or no one else in place, yeah, you, couldn't, yeah. you couldn't really mention it. But I remember playing that game and being super creeped out. I'm like, oh, this is like a horror game or something? And it kind of comes across that way, yeah, but it isn't, it isn't like really comfortable. Yeah. But, it, but it does like sort of test your morals like by the end of it. It's like, yeah, I highly, both of us would highly recommend giving that a shot. Oh, yeah, 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 check it out. It's, it's, it's a really interesting game. Anyway, so yeah, when yeah. that was coming out, um, like uh, Chris sent me a message just being like, uh, like, oh, it's just gotten way too big. Like the servers have just collapsed and now mm -hmm. no one can play. And it's like, it's just wasting people's time, it's a disaster, I'm just going to take it down. Yep. And I was like, um, and we, we were like, we were talking online, like, um, like I was talking to Chris about it, and eventually like, we worked out a plan to like, get the servers back up and get them hosted like, cloud style so they could scale and stuff. And like, we were working through it, like, uh, like Chris very generously says that like, I was helping him get it back together, but I really wasn't doing much of <laughs> being like, you can do it, Chris. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, yeah, but that was great. Like, um, I think coming out of that, uh, like the the weird like sort of scale that Mariah got to it's like uh, we could finally do some like a bonding over like the nightmares of having like 10 million people descending on your thing yeah. at once and like your servers are exploding and your yeah. inbox is out of control and you're like how do you deal with all these people and I'm like oh let me tell you Chris yeah. <laughs> like, it's like yeah I think it might have exploded around the time that like, PewDiePie picked it up because he picked yeah, it up like yeah. maybe a year and a half ago and yeah I was really surprised I'm like, oh cool that got picked up and then yeah I just saw it like kind of everywhere for a while yeah and yeah it was yeah crazy. it had this little like wave across the internet yeah, and, like, it's, it's cool and, yeah you feel the trap got it but um yeah I know so especially after the like the big sales piece on that um it was it was pretty good to like, I, I think Chris will tell the story way better because his like side of it was much more interesting where he was going through like sure. just the chaos of dealing with all the servers and things and then like yeah. like uh, yeah got to talk to got to talk to each other about like how you handle like the volume of this sort of thing and like like the pressure of it and stuff um, so that was good so like we're we're in the same boat with that now like having dealt with like the uh, the joys and nightmares of the Steam front page and yeah, um, yeah it's good so. It's it's really cool talking to Chris and like I said he uh, he played through Labyrinth just before it came out and his feedback as always really helped. Um, like what I'm working on next is like sort of like a mod support extensions campaign editor thing for Hackner um, and hopefully Chris will be making something for that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we'll get to we'll get to see what he's up to. Um, be a mind bending experience I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think he's uh, he's pretty good to like work with. I, I really like. 
playing through like his stuff. Like when Expand came out, I did a like a whole playthrough of it and like uploaded it to like a like an unlisted YouTube thing and sent him a link and like had my whole commentary over it, being like, I should change this. This is a bit fast or like. Um, and he does the same thing with all the like hacking that stuff. So that's yeah. great. It's pretty good. It's good. Have good having another designer that you really respect. Like, yeah. To like bounce ideas off. And, I think that's a good word for it. Yeah. This, yeah. This, it does seem to be mutual respect between uh -huh. between you guys, which is great. Um, I guess in the last five minutes or so that we have, why don't we talk about uh, the mod support that you have coming up for HackNet then? Sure. So, so what's going on with that? Yeah, so I'm not actually calling it mod support because it's not quite what it is. I'm calling it extensions, um, but it's sort of like a campaign editor almost. Basically, it'll let you build your own sort of story with the HackNet tools, um, which is like, you know, custom themes and missions and computers and like, you know, factions and servers and that whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, so. I built the tools to let people like make their own stuff, and it's going to be Steam Workshop integrated, um, and yeah, it should be really good. Like one of the one of the reasons I'm like doing this is because I'm going to start easing off of Hacknet development into like doing experiments with other things. I don't want to just like abandon the community, so um, this sort of gives them the resources to build their own stuff, right, and keep the content and you know game like fresh and like expand it out as much as they want. Like while I work on other things, I'm going to come back to Hackman eventually to finish off multiplayer. Which, like an idiot, I promised yeah. Neo release week, and it's just like going to be a very time-consuming and expensive mistake to have made. So, what does what does multiplayer look like then? Is it just like uh, trying to compete against each other? Or? Yeah. So there are a whole bunch of like different ways I could do it. Um, before anyone asks or comments or tweets me again, it's not going to be an MMO. All right, that's that's an entirely different game. How does that all right, even work? Uh, it doesn't work. Is the answer? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I know that would be awesome, but that's an entirely new game, and I'm not just kind of passion into this one. Yeah. Um, but it'll either be like one v one or like a co op thing. Um, so I have a couple of different plans, and eventually, like after I've like cleared my head for some other projects and prototypes, I'll come back to Hacknet and um, like uh, do some more experiments, and then like add in a multiplayer thing at some point. Um, and I've got some ideas to that, and I think it's going to be pretty cool. But um, nothing's confirmed. There's not going to be a date for that yet. That's going to be a fair way off. But extensions should keep people, you know, pretty occupied until then. Yep. Um, but extensions are really exciting because, like, there's this weird thing about like making games. Like, I want I made Hacknet because I really wanted to play Hacknet. Like, yep. I, I loved Uplink so much. Yep. Um, but I, I saw all these problems in like the interface and the way it was presented and. Like it seemed a little bit dated almost, and that's because it was. That game's like 15 years old or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really wanted to like play Hackman. I wanted it to exist, and like I loved making it. But it means that I've never actually gotten the chance to play it because I already knew all the solutions to all the puzzles, yeah. and like um, I knew how everything worked on such a deep level that like it didn't feel like a game to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really excited to check out some of these mods so I can like see what it's like I'm from the other side. Game. Yeah, yeah, um, cool. yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and I'm pretty happy with how the tools worked out. Um, we've got some super secret like community members making <coughs> stuff for day one launch now, um, and it's really exciting seeing them use the tools and making their own themes and things, and like you know not recognizing screenshots from my own game. So it's cool. yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, really it feels cool. really good. So um, like that process is like really exciting. So um, like looking forward to that. That's going to be coming out like uh, at the end of this month. Actually. Oh wow! Okay. So, yeah, so it's pretty close. Um, cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty well into development now. But yeah, it's been really good to work on, especially the tutorial. Like, so many things about that just fit so nicely into place given the context of Hacknet. So I made like my own mod using the tools that teaches you how to use the mod tools. Like the first mission is like put the game in windowed mode, open the folder that contains this mission, and then like like look at how the format works, and now type in the password that it says at the top is required to continue. Yeah. Um. So there's a lot of like really interesting stuff. Like, it was really like satisfying to make, because like making content for like Hacknet can be pretty exhausting. Like mm -hmm. it feels, it feels like I have to have this capture this certain feeling and things so precisely now that it's like it's, it's difficult. Yeah. But um, you can't kind of pull it around and mold what Hacknet is. Hacknet is already something. Yeah, that's yeah, and I have to make here. something that like fits there. Yeah. Um, but um, making the modules is really good because I can make like a whole bunch of like things and just see what people do with them, um, which is like you know really good. I really love programming and um, like making something like Labyrinths is a lot more about 
making uh, like the content and writing for it, then he's actually coding up new stuff. Yep. So um, yeah, modules have been really good. But you have to cook up a bunch of stuff and just see what people do with it. So That's yeah, awesome. it's been really cool to work on. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks a lot for joining me. So we've yeah, sure. so Hacknet's already out. That's been out for a while. We've got mm. Hacknet Lab, which came out. Hacknet Labyrinths, which came yep. out uh, two months ago. About one month. Ago. About one month ago, yeah. and then we've got. It's yeah, really fast for mod support. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then we've got uh, extensions coming out later on this month. So yep. it's been quite busy and stuff. So yeah, yeah. make sure to should look forward to that. Uh, hit you up on Twitter. What's your Twitter? Uh, o R A N N. Oren. Oren. All right, yep. there you go. So follow Matt. Follow me. I'm at Mangello with a zero at the end, not an O. Nice. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so um, yeah, and and be sure to check out Hacknet and. Keep up to, to date with what's going on with that game, and um, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Where, where, where are we going to see you next? Um, where can people find you if they want to talk to you oh, face to face? I'm not sure what's up next. You're going to be at AppCon or anything? Like I mean, that? I'll probably be at AppCon. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'll be showing a game there, but I might be on panels or something. I don't know. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. yeah, yeah. I should do a panel with Chris. That'd be cool. That'd be really yeah. good. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be really good. Um, yeah, so I'll be at that. I'll probably be at Axos. Um, I'm going to go to Tokyo Game Show if you're going to be at that. Hopefully. Oh yeah, that'd be great. So be yeah, I've got a whole bunch of like convention planning to do in the next couple of weeks. Excellent. So yeah, not sure, but almost certainly I've gone in Paxos. Awesome. All right. Well, look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for joining me on the show. Thanks, Evan. No worries.